Hey everybody, welcome to Global Finishing Solutions here in Osseo, Wisconsin. My name is Jason Garfoot. Uh, we're very excited to announce a new uh, webinar series coming from ABRN in partnership with GFS. We have some very special guests for our first very episode special. here. Uh, so a great partner of ours, uh, a good friends too, they live close by so we get to do a lot of cool stuff together, work with a lot of shops, they actually helped us in our training center here. Um, but I'll let Brad and Jason here introduce themselves. Thanks, Jason. <laughs> so I'm Brad Gravenhoff uh, with Dan Am Company. We're the distributor of SADA for the U.S. as well as all of our Dan Am products. Um, and I'm my main role is the Dan Am Air sales and technical side of things. I'm Jason Gravenhoff, the younger, better looking brother. <laughs> Um, I deal more on the sales and technical side of SADA, so anything to do with our spray guns, our air filtration, our breathing equipment. And these are the experts, so when I have questions on stuff, whether it's airlines, filtration, um, any of the fresh air supply stuff, um, even the spray guns, these are the guys I reach out to directly. So if you end up with questions after you watch this, make sure you reach out to GFS or Brad, Jason, Tony any of the guys at SADA Dan Am, and they'll be sure to answer any of those questions for you. Um, that being said, we'll get into today's topic. We're talking about paint shop layout and how that can actually dictate the rest of your shop layout. And that's a big part of what my job is here at GFS. Um, I get to play with a lot of the cool new equipment and things like that, but most of the time I'm working with shop owners, shop managers, people that are either building new shops or renovating their old shop. Uh, and a huge part of that is figuring out where is this equipment going to go, what's the right equipment to have in there, and it can be a very daunting topic to look at. There's tons of things you have to consider, so hopefully today we can show you ways to simplify that. Um, there'll be a few key things we can show you to really focus in on, and once you do that, the other things will just kind of fall into place. Instead of having a thousand decisions to make, Maybe it'll get cut down to just a couple hundred, <laughs> so you're not as stressed. Um, and we'll show you a lot of things that get overlooked, one of those being airlines, how to run them, um, how many drops to have, um, even running a loop system, which I'm sure we'll talk about. Uh, a lot of shops, though, they think about the equipment and how many technicians I need, and then once everything's done, and they're about ready to open, it's, oh yeah, we need air. Air volume, air volume. Right. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Especially when they ramp up production. You know, if it's somebody who's going from maybe a $3 million gross sales, and now all of a sudden they want to grow to six or even 10, and they're really expanding their shop, they don't realize what that means on the air side now. Yeah. So these guys will help give good insight into that. Uh, so with that being said, we'll jump into the first part of that, which is going to be, uh, your current and future production goals. That'll help answer a lot of those questions. So let's dive into that next. So like I said, it can be a very daunting task to figure out how much equipment you need, how many technicians you need, how to lay out your shop. But this is where I always start. I like to keep it very simple and focus on just two things. And those two things will really help through that process. The first of those things is your production numbers. So your current numbers, and your future goals. And I'll show you how to break that down into a usable way. The second thing is the paint shop itself. Don't think about estimating the, the body side, all of that first, and I'll show you why. Um, once we figure out these numbers, we know how many cars have to go through our paint shop. And the paint shop is usually considered the bottleneck in most locations. So if we know how many cars need to go through our paint shop, we can size that appropriately. And then the rest of the layout is just figuring the most efficient way to get cars into that paint shop. And it'll also tell you how many body stalls you need, all that other kind of information, which I'll show you how to calculate as well. So this is usually where I start. Um, if you're redoing a shop that you currently have, I like to go over your current gross sales and then break that down into a usable number. If you're starting a new shop, you want to find what your goal is going to be and make sure that goal is realistic. That's also something you can work with GFS on. We can take a look at your market and see due to the size and population what a realistic goal might be coming out of that. Um, also, if you're redoing your shop, you want to figure 
I know this is what I'm doing now. This is where I want to get to in the future. How am I going to have to change my building to do that? So if I don't have enough equipment, am I going to have to add on? Um, am I going to have to rearrange a lot of stuff around? Because all that's obviously going to affect the cost. So make sure you have a budget ready too. But this is where we like to start. So current gross sales. So let's say you're a shop that does uh, $3 million a year. So if we're doing $3 million a year, we want to be able to break that down into this usable number that I keep talking about. And that usable number is cars per day. So we want to figure out how many cars a day we need to get through our paint shop. So let's say we have our gross sales of $3 million. And here's where you need to know your average work order number. So how much your average work order is. I can tell you right now the national average in the United States anyway uh, is a little over $3,000 per work order is the average. I like to just use $3,000 um, as a basic number. I always like to go on the low side so I know everything doesn't have to be perfect to hit my gross sales number. That gives you a little bit of cushion in there. So if we're doing $3 million uh, a year and our average work order is 3,000. We'll just divide 3 million by 3,000 and you're left with a thousand. That's how many cars a year I have to get through my shop. So our cars per year is uh, 1,000. And now this is where things get tricky. Some people divide that by days in a year and that's not the best way to go. You have to remember that most shops you're going to have technicians that are on vacation. You may have shutdowns for maintenance. Um, obviously this last year there was a whole nother thing to consider. But the way I like to build some cushion into this is to figure instead of 52 weeks of year, think there's only 50 and then there's only five working days. So that leaves you with 250 working days per year. So that gives you a nice big cushion. So if we take our 1,000 divided by 250 working days in a year, we're left with a car per day total of four. So we know that as long as we get four cars per day through our paint shop and our average work order hovers around that national average, we're gonna hit that $3 million gross sales goal. So this is important when you're thinking about your future goals. So if you wanna double your production and get to six million, it's easy. We know we're gonna probably have to get eight cars a day. So now it's time to take a look at your equipment and how you're set up. Uh, GFS can also help you with this. There's some basic numbers for every piece of equipment that'll show you kind of what we see on average for production out of that equipment. And what I mean by that is there's different kinds of booths. You have a downdraft, a crossdraft, a semi-down. Those are all gonna be capable of different production levels. So a standard downdraft booth the average painter is going to get four to six cycles a day through that. So if they're focusing on one car at a time, we know that if your goal is three million, we can probably do that with average production numbers. If our goal was say four or five million, and now we need five or six cars per day, now we're kind of at the peak of what that equipment can put out. So we know everything would have to be perfect every day for that painter to get six cars a day out of that booth then we're cutting it pretty thin. So we might wanna look at leaving some extra space where we may be able to add another booth later or start bringing in some other technology that can speed it up and get more cycles a day out of that booth. And that's things like uh, some of the newer paints that are out there. There's clear coat that cures in about half as much time in a cure cycle. There's things we sell like our Revo equipment that drastically reduces that cycle time. Um, there's even things like side load systems where now there's no masking in the booth. So if we're saving, say it takes us 15 minutes to mask a car up, if we do that four times through our paint cycles a day, we may have an extra time to get one more car through there now. So we wanna be able to pad that number to make sure we can hit our goal. Um, so that's a very easy way to break down the numbers and figure out how many cars per day you're gonna get. Then we can move on to the body side from there. And again, your equipment company, hopefully it's GFS, but if it's not, make sure you ask them questions. They should be able to help you with this stuff and size the equipment according to your production goals. And let's go to this, let's say it's 6 million, right? So we're currently a $3 million shop. We want to double production. So we know we're gonna to have to get to eight cars per day now instead of the four. 
So one booth probably isn't going to cut it, right? I'm probably going to need to, or I'm really going to have to invest in technology to make sure I can hit that number. So if we have two booths and we know we need to get to eight cars, this is what I mean where we can use that number to make the rest of the shop sort of fall into place. Obviously there'll be small decisions to make. What I mean is people say, well, how many body stalls do I need? Look at your current production. If you're at 3 million and you have four technicians working in your shop, four body techs, we know if we're getting four cars per day currently and there's four body techs, that they're each producing about one car a day um, that's ready for paint. So if that's the case, we are probably gonna have to add some body techs. But the other key piece of information I can give you is talk to your technicians. Find out if they're capable of more, but maybe with your current shop layout and other limitations, they're not able to do as much as they think they are. Sometimes it's simple things. I've seen where it's a bunch of body technicians that are sharing one cart, so they all have to run across the shop to grab stuff. Maybe they're constantly running out of things in stock where you can get everybody their own cart, which is a little easier to manage and keep them moving and keep them productive. Also, that'll help you on the front and making sure you pre-order parts, you're mirror matching things. If they're telling you half the time I'm waiting for a part or a part comes in wrong, we got to look at ways to clean that up first. So that'll really help set up the rest of your shop. So those are the basic ways that I break down those numbers. I keep it as simple as possible and you have to make sure you build that cushion in there. So just remember your current gross sales or your goal of future gross sales your average work order number, and again, I use this for an average, um, and then your cars per day is the key. And we'll use that throughout this. I'll show you how that'll affect a lot of different things as we continue forward. Okay, so now that we know maybe our future production goals or how many cars per day we need to get out, um, there's a few more things that we're gonna have to look at in the paint shop, and those are gonna bleed over into the body shop as well to make sure that we get a, a the right layout that's gonna work for what we're trying to do. And keep in mind there are other things that could affect those numbers I showed you. So that national average, that $3,000 work order, that can vary by region. You know, maybe you're in a more of a rural area where there's a lot of deer hits is most of your collision work. You may be doing fewer cars per day, but your work order average is probably gonna be higher. So those numbers usually kind of level out in the end. But if you want to do something very specific to your shop, maybe you're doing some kind of specialty work, just look at your current numbers now. You should be able to track that pretty easily. Even look at the last three months and see what your average work order number is, and that'll really help you hit that. Now, something I see is we use that at GFS to figure out, again, how many booths they need, how many preps they need, how we can most effectively hit those goals. Um, if they plan on growing beyond that, how we can leave space in the layout to add stuff later. But something I see that gets overlooked all the time is on the airline side and even the filtration side. Um, we kind of ran into that here, even in our mm -hmm. own training center. We built everything, we had all the equipment figured out what we were gonna do with it. And about three days before distributors were coming in to actually look at everything, we realized we still had to run our loop. And I see that happen in shops all the time. Lucky, luckily enough, these guys are close, so Brad is able to jump in his car and we were able to do that quickly, um, which is a great feature of the stuff that you guys offer. Is it installs quickly and it's a really good product. But when we talk about air in general, I mean, what are some of the things that people need to consider and look well, at? You're exactly right that the air is uh, not necessarily an afterthought. Everybody knows we have to have it, but it may not be on the top of the list where it is it is one of the more crucial things especially in the paint shop um, in the in the body side uh, it's everything has gone so much to cordless tools sure in the past few years that it air it, we still need air in the body side but it's way more prevalent in in the paint side mm -hmm. the the spray guns the breathing equipment that's all what takes the the large volumes of air and more continual, right? It's for 10, yeah. 15, 20, 30 minutes at a time. Well, especially a lot of times with, a tool is a couple and with, minutes. Right, and with water base now too, I mean, if people yeah, are blowers. retrofitting, they're using the blowers, yeah, there's yeah, a yeah. large draw. Yeah. yeah, so that, we need to make sure that we have, I mean, if we say it starts right from the compressor, we can't have an undersized compressor. We have to have enough compressor 
to meet our needs and that is all dependent on if we have one booth or two booths or three booths or four booths if we have one guy spraying or two or so a, a good rule of thumb uh, on compressor size which I'm gonna leave most of the compressor to uh, your the compressor the comp professionals compressor <laughs> person of your choice okay? <laughs> but a good rule of thumb that I work off of is about four a compressor will generate roughly four CFM per horsepower Okay, so that, that's a good number to, to start with. Uh, if we figure a spray gun, an HBLP spray gun will take up to 15 CFM and a fresh air hood, 10 to 12 CFM. If we figure 25 to 30 CFM per painter, that'll help us roughly decide what size compressor we need. Sure. Right, a, a 10 horse is gonna give you roughly 40 CFM. So that's going to be enough for one painter and the rest of the shop, maybe. 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 If the doesn't, airlines are doesn't run properly. Right. Too, right. Yeah. If, if airlines are run properly and the body side doesn't need a lot of air. So that starting with the right size compressor is crucial. Because that compressor also, it's not just a compressor. We need to make sure we have some sort of drying system, some sort of filtration on the main system itself before we even get branching out into the shop. And so those are again, things that are, they're so easy to overlook. So the shop where I was a production painter, we renovated, you know, we needed more space. We needed to get more cars through and we actually used a GFS booth that we had put in. And that was again, one of those things we knew we had to do something with our air, but we didn't know what. Yeah, and it's so easy to get lost once you start working on your shop and putting in equipment. Right. There's so many things happening and so much stuff to coordinate that all of a sudden, all right, we're ready. We're going to be open. You know, it's maybe it's Thursday, and we're going to be open on Monday. Oh no! Now we still well, haven't yeah. fixed our air. Brad and I experienced firsthand in a shop like you of being the spray booth at the end of yeah. a piping system, yeah. and coming outside of the booth and saying, "Hey, y'all need to stop working for ten minutes right. so I can get this job out before yeah. the end of the week." So that's another thing in routing. And, and yeah, that, yeah, that's where layout really comes into into play. Uh, but, but we so often see, like Jason said, where the compressor is in that corner of the building and the spray booth is put in that corner of the building over there mm -hmm. and there's an airline ran to it with a whole bunch of techs in between, which right. is the exact scenario that we dealt with. And by the time the air gets there, there's no air left for the guy that needs the most amount of air. Mm -hmm. For the most amount of time right the and there's just demand. fluctuation which can cause inconsistency not just you know in the overall quality of your clear coat but with some of the water base now if there's fluctuation in your air pressure when you're spraying yeah. it can affect color yeah so it might not be a simple fix like buffing something it's we're going to have to repaint yeah, it's and a redo mm -hmm. but it's, I, i've also ran into the scenario where that is the case so that we're running out of air so they buy another air compressor or they and they still don't have enough air it's back again it was due to routing not necessarily that the compressor wasn't big enough but it just they couldn't get it there efficiently so what is always recommended what we always recommend and and anybody that works with airlines will is to create a looped system somewhere now that doesn't mean that you have to take your 60 by 200 shop and loop the entire perimeter of it. You may, you may just need to loop over top of your paint area and then branch off of that to your shop area. Again, you maybe don't have the demand for that volume in your shop area. So you can, it, it's so dependent on the facility in there. Mm -hmm. Everyone is, everyone is different. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's always, uh, a back and forth trying to figure out what's the best scenario for any given shop. Anytime you loop a system like that uh, uh, to pipe size, anytime the, the system is connected back to itself, that's just, that system, any given pipe size will almost double the amount of CFM that it will deliver. Just because it can kind of travel either direction, it just equals everything out and makes everything on, on a level playing field where you're not starving air from another area of the of it the relieves that directional travel and it also basically doubles your capacity right which is key because if you think how expensive compressors are 
you want to make sure you're utilizing that thing and getting the most out of it. The right. cost of running a compressor is hugely overlooked. Yes, right? That's a, which, a which also brings up a good point realize. of leaks. Mm -hmm. Leaks in a shop are a huge consumer of energy and a high cost. Like I said, that's very expensive to run that compressor. So if, if you any leak you can get rid of, to keep that compressed air inside where it's supposed to be, not leaking back out into into the atmosphere, that's that's what you want to do. And the the aluminum systems are great for that. Mm -hmm. They're ours is guaranteed not to leak if it's installed properly. So it it it's a good proponent for the aluminum systems. Mm -hmm. Well, and it's just a it's another point that it's don't be afraid to ask questions and make sure you work with good companies that are gonna help you with this stuff. So you think if you're a shop owner watching this right now, when it's time to fix a car that a customer brings in, you're not typically asking the customer how to fix it. You're asking your technicians, you're looking at the tech data sheets or maybe your OEM procedures for mm -hmm. that specific vehicle. So you have to remember when you're renovating a shop or building a new shop, you are now that customer. So make sure you trust the experts, the things they tell you are there for a reason. Um, I've seen, when we first did our shop, we, we didn't ask questions. We tried to do as much as we could. We got a brand new compressor, new dryer, but we, we didn't know enough to run a loop. So we had this whole new system. We thought everything was gonna be great and we were immediately having issues. We also used black pipe, which probably wasn't <laughs> ideal. Um, but we, we didn't really know much better. Um, there wasn't a ton of information out there and we definitely weren't really looking for it. Um, but I mean, hindsight's twenty twenty. that cost us a lot in the end because we realized we had a problem right away. Um, and then we had oil in the pipes, which caused a lot of contamination issues, but we had to go in and add that loop or finish that loop later to alleviate the, mm -hmm. the pressure fluctuations we were having. So make sure you reach out to people That's and ask. The that's the thing about getting somebody involved early, right? Mm -hmm. Is you know what you know and I know what I know and every shop mm -hmm. owner knows what they know, but Brad's collected two questions from you and two from me and two from this mm -hmm. shop owner and two from that one. Hopefully we can help you think of something you have. Right? Yes. Hopefully we ask that question that creates that light bulb. That, oh, we didn't take that into consideration. Mm -hmm. Perfect, we've done our job then. Now yeah. let's talk about it. And, and that's a great point because a lot of our customers may not know, but we, we have a lot of great partners here and a lot of people in the industry, they talk to each other and work with each other on a lot of projects. So we've worked together on several things. So we have a lot of mutual customers. So even though the end user may not realize it, we're coordinating on those projects. If we have a big shop or maybe an MSO that we both work with, we'll set up things ahead of time to make sure it's all gonna work together to work for the end user. Um, we even did that for one, we had, we basically pre-built panels with the filtration mm -hmm. and everything with their stuff on it and then our sensors and our valves built all together. So whenever that type of customer ordered the booth, we know we could send that panel, it has everything they need for everything they're gonna do and the type of work they do. So it's essentially plug and play at that point. Right. So yeah, definitely reach out and make sure you ask those questions. Yeah. It's, it's, it's a lot nicer to get started in your new shop when everything is, is working like it should, instead of chasing all those demons right yeah. last minute. Interrupting production once, you're, once you've begun. Yeah, nothing's worse than having, I mean, it's just like redoing a car when you thought it was done and now you have to go back and work yeah. on it again. Mm -hmm. It's the same as your shop. You think you're finally done, you've made it through all the headaches, now you fire up your booth, you go to spray that first car and you realize, I guess we have some more work to do. Close that yeah. workflow valve back down again to make right. Right. To make. You know, one question I get a lot is, oh yeah, this, this airlines, we want to go with the newest technology, but what is the cost? Mm -hmm. Okay, we have to do airlines. What are, what are we going to do for airlines? Are we going to do black pipe, mm -hmm. galvanize? Are we going to do copper? Are we going to do... You, you need to look also at not just what it's gonna cost you up front, but what it's gonna do for you down the road. Mm -hmm. So the aluminum systems have a big advantage there as well as far, the big selling points to me are the ease of installation 
stuff super easy to install yourself. We did our whole training center, so we ran this whole loop for all of the spray equipment. And we have a lot here. There's a full booth, a huge double prep, and then we have an aluminum repair station right next to it, and then we have drops outside of that. Yeah. And we did the whole thing in a couple hours, maybe? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I was in and out of here in a day. I yeah, that. so I was very, and that was my first experience with actually being hands-on with installing this, this newer aluminum pipe. And it, I mean, your fitting specifically made it pretty easy. Yeah, th those are the big selling points. The ease of installation, now, and that's if you want to do it yourself. Super easy to do yourself. If you don't have the, if you don't want to do it yourself, you don't have the time. You don't. It's super easy to have professionally installed too. It, it, putting together pipe is pipe. It all goes together the same way. You still have to cut it, measure. But the, the how it all goes together and being able to... The other big selling point is how the aluminum system are modular and and removable, reusable. You can take it apart, put it back together. It's That's the only system you can do that with. You can't do that with copper. You can't do that with black pipe. And that's something that's been helpful for us too. I mean, we try to make sure shops get the right amount of equipment. And look, when I was talking about those production numbers earlier, you may be a $3 million a year shop now and you want to get to six, but you know that could be five or six years down the road. Mm -hmm. Next year, I know I can be a $4 million shop. So maybe I don't need to buy three spray booths, but I need to leave room for one later. Right. Or I know I'm going to have to add a prepper or add a stall in between. These newer type systems allow that freedom where if you need to make a, an extra drop in there or run a piece off of it, it's quick. You don't have to reconfigure everything. You're not cutting threads. Yes. It's a very simple yeah. It can be done in solution. minutes instead of calling your plumber and waiting a week for the plumber to get there and so still yeah. having to Back go through to the Back to the process. nearest union with two big pipe wrenches. <laughs> right, yeah. 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 Well, and what's nice, what we did here too is we thought we might need extra drops in our facility, so we just kept a few extra things on hand, mm -hmm. so enough stuff for another drop. Um, so if we had to add that, we could do it very quickly. But so let's say I'm a new shop owner, you know, I've, I've got my paint equipment figured out. I have a rough idea of where I should run my airline. So I reach out and find the, the best way to run those, which you guys obviously mm -hmm. help with as well. So why are some other reasons I would want this aluminum system? Or do you want to actually go through and kind of show how those fittings work and what makes it easy to use and yeah, why that so should be something they should consider? There again, it's kind of all dependent on the situation. So once I once I get the information on the sizing, and I can then kind of help with pipe size, routing, that kind of stuff. Now again, if you're gonna install it yourself, we get you the product, we'll help train you on the product, but that's a pretty simple process as well. So if we take a look at uh, some of the fittings and how this these aluminum systems kind of work and what makes them maybe superior to some of the other type of systems is uh, our system, all the fittings are a reinforced nylon composite material. All of the pipe is an extruded aluminum, a high grade 6063 T5 um, aluminum, which is bendable with a regular conduit bender. That is a that's a that's a pretty slick um, option right there. Uh, some of the competitive companies will sell you this piece. Now you need another fitting on either end of it to get the job done. The trick with this stuff is to uh, to get the job done with the fewest amount of fittings possible. Uh, our system, how we were talking about how quick and easy it is to install. Uh, if you if you can see here, these fittings all come. Uh, pre-torqued at the factory you can see those marks there they all they all line up those caps are tight uh, they're made out of a reinforced nylon they're all triple sealed so there's a seal that seals the cap to the body of the fitting and then there's a double nitrile seal inside of the cap that seals to the pipe and now that's made out of nitrile not just a rubber o-ring so that won't dry out and crack over time and then there's stainless grips grip ring inside to uh, hold it all together so that's all torqued at the factory ready to go those caps are tight literally to install this stuff you take your pipe and you press it into the fitting and you're done there's no loosening no tightening no wondering how tight is tight with your with your span and wrenches you literally press it to connect
So at just seeing that, you can imagine how fast it is to install. Once you've decided where, the hard part is deciding where you need to run your pipe, where you want drops. Once you've done that, it just all clicks together. Now, this is reusable as well, so you can loosen up that fitting cap. You wiggle the pipe to release the grip ring inside, and the pipe just slides right out. Once you've done that, that's what our arrows are for. We line our arrows back up, and it's ready to reuse again. So the fittings are super easy to work with. Uh, there's a complete set of threaded connectors for anything you may need as far as regulators, compressor hookups. Um, how we do a typical drop is with a gooseneck type bracket. We talked about uh, a future expansion. Let's say uh, we added a tech over uh, on the other side of the shop where there isn't any air. How that works is you can literally uh, get a hold of us, get the toolkit. We loan that we have that on a loaner type program. Uh, we send it out, and you can install a, a drop yourself in minutes. You literally take your piece of pipe, put the jig on it. We have a special hole saw. You drill the hole into the pipe. Once you've cleaned up that hole. Then this bracket just simply wraps around the pipe, tightens down with an Allen wrench. Now to add a drop with any other system, you'd have to cut into it, go back to a union, make up the difference. A lot more work involved. Back again to the, the benefits of these systems, ease of installation, modular design, how you can add on, change, and go from there. So as you can see, I mean, there's a lot of things to think about with pipe and, and pipe isn't all the same. So again, the best thing you can do is reach out. Um, again, there's people there to help. Layout of pipe is so crucial. Um, I see a lot of mistakes made with that. So it's a huge part of your actual paint shop layout. Diameter. <laughs> Di yeah, everything. Diameter uh, layout. I mean, you can really starve a compressor or overwork a compressor, yeah. which then shortens the life of that. So. Anything you might save on the front end by going with those, I won't say names of them, there's some very cheap systems out there where people think they save a lot of money up front, but then it comes back to bite you later. Um, we see it on the paint booth side as well. Um, one other key thing I like to touch on is, I briefly talked about in the production numbers, trying to figure out how many techs you have. So again, you can take your current numbers, pay attention to what your techs are doing, and talk to them to see you know, what's holding you back. If there's one thing you could change that you think would make you more productive, what would that be? And whether it's a slightly bigger stall or maybe they need an upgraded tools or something like that, there's a lot of things that can factor into how much production they can produce. But good text can be very hard to find, especially now. Everywhere I go, people are asking if I know anybody that's looking, because uh, it's, it's hard to find good people. So one thing that's important is not just making sure they have good tools, but also taking care of those people. And what I mean by that is, I mean, at our facility, we work with a lot of the paint companies and they even do a lot of their painter certification classes here. And we see a lot of newer painters that come in because the old painter went down with isocyanate sensitization, they can't paint anymore um, because all that stuff has built up. Um, so one thing I recommend to all shops is make the investment of some type of fresh air system and make sure it's a good one and it's proper and it's gonna make that painter comfortable um, so they can stay with you and work for a long time. And again, talk to your technicians to see what they do and don't like. That's something you guys I think do better than most. Uh, we use those systems here as well too and we'll have um, in our booth, I mean, we'll have eight to 10 people in there at one time taking turns spraying. So making sure we have the proper equipment and everything is sized appropriately is very crucial here um, at our facility. So make sure it is at yours. And we can talk about some of this stuff. Um, I think what's even more important than just the hoods and all that themselves is making sure the air is safe. Um, something that's also very much overlooked uh, and not just from the safety side, but make sure your air is safe to paint with. So there's a lot That's of things cool. you yeah. need to consider. So 
I mean, what are some things when it comes to filtration that people need to pay attention to and what they need to look at? Well, that's really how we look at our filtration systems, right? Is we take it back to that first question of that compressor, how much air are you creating? How much air do we have available? You said it, we need it clean for, I mean, obviously you want it clean for your tools. Yeah. Is that quite as picky as a spray gun or breathing? Probably not, but you still need clean air. Um, that spray gun's you know, more sensitive now with all the waterborne products that are out there. Um, we had kind of a learning curve, I think, within the industry or certainly within our company that a lot of us that sprayed solvent back in the day would see those tiny little fish eyes and you just kind of give it a little dusting, a face <laughs> coat, and they went away and you could maybe get away with it. Um, that drastically went away when waterborns came around. Um, it took us a while to put together uh, the dots and, and figure it out, but after we did, we realized how simple it was that these fish eyes, these defects are only showing up where there was base coat applied. Sure. Well, that means it's coming out of the spray gun. Mm -hmm. and just like we all learned as kids with oil and water, if we've got that little micron of oil with the waterborne, it comes to the surface and we don't see it as a fish eye, mm -hmm. but it floats on the top of that base coat. But now when we go to put our clear coat over it, now is when it's gonna rear that ugly head. And now we're at the point in the process where it's tough to fix, right? right. We already have clear coat down. This is gonna be a problem. So. We need that clean air for tools, for spray guns, but you said it probably most important of all is, you know, is the health of that worker, is the safety on that side. Um, going back to air volume, that's really where we start asking our questions because, you know, within the SADA line, we, we basically carry two series of filters. And where we place them or which one we recommend is really based off of air volume. Um, our smaller 200 series unit does 70 CFM at 90 PSI. Um, our bigger units were at 129 and 135 PSI. So back to what Brad mentioned earlier, when we're looking specifically in a paint shop, we're looking at all the equipment you're gonna use, how many technicians you have, are they breathing? Um, the 30 number that Brad threw out is kind of what we go by. Like you said, uh, an HVLP gun, you know, kind of max in the industries around 15 CFM. You know, that breathing hood sitting in front of you is rated anywhere from six to 10. We leave a little bit of room in there in our calculations. We have an accessory air cooler, um, which is also great which is for the tax. And that's, yeah, that's another one of those things. Comfort. I mean, I, I work with a lot of painters, and especially you get down south and you talk mm -hmm. about how technical water-based paint has become. If it's a hundred degrees and you're in Florida and you're spraying yeah. and it's humid out, you have to turn your booth temperature to above that so the burners kick on to try to burn out some of that humidity so the water can dry. Yeah. So now your booth is maybe 110 degrees. Your painters aren't maybe the happiest. You might have a nice air-conditioned building for your text, but that <laughs> booth is pulling air from outside. Um, so that's, again, those little things like that air cooler can make a huge difference. Now your painter's in a nice air-conditioned suit spraying away. Where we used to hear about painters couldn't wait to get out of the booth, mm -hmm. Now we hear about painters can't wait to get back in the booth, <laughs> right. get their hood plugged back sure. in. Sure. And we're Midwestern people, right? It's the same thing when your head's cold, right? Once yeah. your head's cold, your whole body's cold. But yeah. when you're in the booth and you've got cool air coming down your neck and over your mm -hmm. face, it it helps a lot, right? Mm -hmm. The comfort level is uh, is important. But, but but on those filter units and back to those numbers, right? If we take 15 for the gun and the six to 10 for the hood, we add that air cooler in there, that 30 is still a good number. Sure. So back to when we're looking at what we're gonna recommend, you know, for your facility based on its size and based on your number of techs, we really almost look at the 200 series as a two technician unit, if they're using guns and breathing equipment, you know, or we've got up to a four person, you know, unit with 129 or 135 CFM. We can run that many techs off of one unit. Now the thing with that, and when most people think of an air filtration unit, you think of it hanging on the wall in your booth, right? It's where you go plug your hose in and it's in there getting overspray on it. And we're trying to get everybody to get away from that thinking. And, and this goes hand in hand with our Dan Amer product because with that being an aluminum product, it's, it's not going to degrade your air quality. So if we get your air clean at point A, we can run to B, C, D, E, and F. We can keep right. running down the and line. That, and keep that cleanliness. Yeah, you're gonna system. have that better air quality all throughout that system. 
so it's a little it's a little bit of a trick and we have to have those discussions right to figure out where that point in the system is um, all the systems are modular as well and we'll go through the breakdown kind of what each system does but maybe we put a more coarse filter with a with an auto drain with a moisture trap on the entire system that's going to keep your tools your tools dry and and clean um, maybe we only put that second and third stage that take you to 0 0.01 micron which is ultra fine and then we add carbon to to finish it off maybe we only put those two stages over by the spray booth sure. i think one big advantage of keeping it outside the booth like that is instead of uh, we've all been in the shop with four booths and they have four filtration units why don't we if if our filter will handle the, your two booths two techs we can put our one filtration unit on the outside of the booth now we can pipe tee off to and, each yeah. booth and that's a good point too is again it's you want to ask those questions because you may be spending more money than you need to spend you might be overdoing it so uh, any filter is going to come with a maintenance cost right, right. Well, so and, you have to weigh out maintaining one unit two units four units and it's important to know what that maintenance procedure and schedule should be as well and that's something we were guilty of at our shop is we didn't typically do the maintenance on our filtration system until we had a problem mm -hmm. and then sometimes it's too late depending on where that filter is for how far that can contamination is spread and that's why again this the newer layouts of pipes they they move that filtration system to outside the booth i'm sure you've all seen inside the booth how much overspray gets on those things and that's just one more contaminant that could work its way in when you're doing that maintenance so i also like having that mounted outside um, but can you go into kind of how the filtration actually works so people would know what maintenance actually needs to be done and, and actually get a look at at what's on the inside sure all right, we'll look a, look a little more into how this filter works and what it does. Um, just using the cutaway here, talked about the three different stages. So uh, the first stage, you can see this white cyclone here. So that's going to spin the air as it comes into that first stage. On the bottom here, there's a float and an auto discharge. So say your refrigerant dryer goes down and you get a plug of water through or it's a real humid day and you have some issues. If there's a massive amount of water, that's basically going to spin dry that air and we're going to collect it here and we're going to purge it out of the system. Um, after that, it goes through here into a centered bronze filter. We'll, we'll look inside here in a minute. Um, that's going to take us down to five microns. So normal hair is generally six to eight microns. So five microns sounds big, but it's still you know smaller than a hair. Once we get into the second stage, the air is going to pass down the middle and out through that filter and we're going to take it down to 0 0.01 micron. Now at that level, there isn't any con contaminant that's smaller than 0 0.01 micron that's going to show up in your paint job. Uh, this third stage is when we were talking about waterborne earlier or about breathing. That third stage is a carbon or an activated charcoal filter. So that's actually going to absorb any residual oil vapors. Um, it's going to scrub that air down to basically perfectly clean. It's at a breathable level at that point. This is actually a brand new filter series we're bringing out. We were talking about maintenance and Jason even mentioned, right, we're not always the best on doing things in a timely manner. Um, I was guilty of it when I was in the shop as well. Uh, we changed our filter change out schedule a little bit. That carbon or activated charcoal filter used to be on three month intervals. Um, with this new series, we've extended it to six. Just makes it a little bit easier to remember. It's a little less frequent. Um, a lot of people do it on New Year's and then again on 4th of July or do it when you turn the clocks forward and back. But uh, the ease of maintenance is a big part. These just turn and slide out and that cartridge drops in there just like you see. So basically we take the new cartridge, we drop it into place and reinstall it. All you gotta do is get it lined up, quarter turn, and it's locked back into place. This first stage filter is a little bit unique because that has that cyclone device that's gonna spin the air. Actually on this new model, we've improved this design. It takes a little less turbulence out and increases flow. But as you can see, everything maintenance-wise on this filter is just by hand. 
that cartridge right there is a centered bronze, it's going to catch all the contaminant on the outside. So when I want to clean this, I can take a blow gun and blow it from the inside out, take something fine like a toothbrush, um, maybe some wax and grease remover, clean that up, blow it dry, make sure it's uncontaminated, and I can go ahead and put that back into the system. So again, when we're talking about the right setup for your, your facility, right? Getting the right, the right filtration system. We're gonna talk about that air volume, whether we're talking 70 CFM or up at 130 CFM, what your demand is. We're also going to uh, talk about whether you need a two or a three stage system. We talked a little bit about what each of these do, you know, with large particles, fine particles, and then basically your uh, residual oil vapors. If you're spraying a solvent product, you never plan to go to waterborne, or you're not using, using a supplied air breathing system, really these first two stages is enough to clean your air to that level. Anytime we're talking about waterborne or anytime we're talking about breathing equipment, we go all the way to three stages. Now when we're talking about our supplied air respirator, we do have the options on belt units. This one right here is basically a carbon or charcoal unit that inserts in here. So it really takes the place of this third stage unit. You don't need both of them, it's really redundant. Um, if you have the three stage filter on the wall, then we have this smaller bell unit that is basically just a pass through valve that you can wear on your hip. So there's a couple different ways we can go about it to get that air to perfectly clean and breathable. Um, like I said, most of the time in today's day and age, we're always planning for the future. We're always assuming that we're gonna want supplied air respirators. If you're not spraying waterborne, still going with three stage prepares you for the future. So that's usually what we're seeing these days. There's one other little extra with uh, our filtration system here that we wanted to show you. You see this small little timer that's placed on the front of the filtration unit. It has a small button on it. Basically all you have to do is depress that button there's a red liquid inside of there that's actually going to wick up that white paper. And they are set at specific intervals, right? Um, with our older filtration system, this one would be a six month, six month, and three month. On the new 500 series we talked about, these are all going to be six month timers. So it's that nice visual, back to maybe we're not all the best at maintenance, it's that simple visual that you can walk in the booth and say, hey, that's red when was the last time we replaced that we need to think about it every time you buy the replacement cartridges it's going to come with new ones of these so you simply throw in the new cartridge pop the button place it back in the holder and it's just that visual reminder of when it's going to be time for your next round of filter cartridges so there's a lot to filtration um, a lot more than a lot of people know uh, a lot more than I knew to getting into it. Like I said, we made those mistakes at our shop and had to try to <laughs> fix them later. Um, but as you start to bring all of these systems together and know how many cars we have to get through, um, our future production goals, what seems realistic, uh, we have to start looking at some other things that you also need to consider. Uh, one of those is as shops have gotten faster and faster and brought in new technology is there's a thing that I call a, a bottleneck transfer. So a lot of people look at the booth and it's always been, you know, the booth is the bottleneck. You know, I can only do four cars a day. Well, now there's things like Revo and Sideload where a booth was doing four cars a day and now maybe it's doing six or eight. But what a lot of shop owners don't think about is what that does to the rest of the shop. Yeah, so when you domino you, effect exactly. carries down. So once you open up that bottleneck, it's just gonna get caught in the next place or you have to figure out what's the proper way to feed this now. So that's another thing to think about that we can really help you with too, but you need to make sure you leave enough space for reassembly and making sure technicians have enough stalls. Um, and there's a lot of debate in the industry. And I mean, if people have good ways to back up the information and feel free to use those. I always think for most of your average technician, two stalls, so they can be reassembling while they're also starting the next Two one. process. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, I've seen some where they say one stall per technician, that's it. And I get that, and that can work in most circumstances, depending on how your technicians are set up. If you have separate people that are doing yeah. reassembly, yeah. great, that's run with that. that process, right? It, of who's yeah. assembling, disassembling, reassembling. Yeah, um, and, and the main thing I'm trying to get across there is 
ask the questions and we can help you because the more we know about your process, the more we can help set up the front and back side of that paint booth. So once things come through paint, you're set up to get them out the door now and not just have a big pile up on that end. Um, and there's other things to consider now too. A big one we get asked about a lot is speed lanes, which I'm sure you guys are starting to see out there. Um, and where a lot of this came from was some of the insurance companies offer this program body shops can sign up for, where if they are able to get cars out in a more expedited way, um, that maybe they'll get more work and they'll be part of this better program to get more cars through. And that's great, but make sure you know what you're getting into. Some of those have a, a three day key to key time, which I think the national average like length of rental last year was around somewhere between I think nine to 11 you know days that's three days does not leave much room for any kind it, of it does not error. <laughs> yeah so you better be systemized and when it comes to the paint shop in order to do that you really need a dedicated space just for that speed line essentially so anything coming in through that insurance line runs through that space um, some of our customers have gotten really creative with it but you're you're gonna have to isolate that line which is gonna mean a little bit more space carved out of your shop and the other thing you really need to start to think about then is technology. Because um, if you have any hiccup on the paint side, anything that delays that job, you're gonna be in trouble quick and it's gonna be hard to hit that number. And that's where we could really dial things in and show you how things like our Revo technology for curing. And there's other systems out there too, but how we need to start looking at how can we cure things faster so we can throw them together right away and buff them right away. If there's paint protection film, how we can get that on immediately. And then also using a, a, you know, a side load type system so we're not wasting booth time with taping. Everything has to be very efficient. Um, and there's other ways too, like a, a standard prep now isn't what it used to be. Or what we call a CTOF is the coding terminology. It means closed top, open front. Yeah. Um, for most of you body guys out there, a prep stall. That's what it was yeah, always called. Post. So that used to be just for primer and jamming parts. Well, the usage of that thing has completely changed and now that's become a production stall. So it's not just priming anymore. Um, with the use of some of the new like vacuum sanding carts that work amazingly well, but again, draw air. You have to plug air into that thing. So you gotta make sure you're leaving drops for that. Um, those type of systems can now convert what was just an area for priming to now where you, you prime you cure it with some sort of accelerated curing, you sand it immediately in that stall with a vacuum sander so everything's nice and clean. And then you can get right into your base coat, accelerated drying on that, and then your final clear coat. And we see shops that process cars in under an hour from primer to clear coat, which is unbelievable. Um, but make sure you do your research before you sign up for those programs and let your your paint company know, your airline company know, and even when you get into the paint gun side, so I mean it, it goes into every aspect of repairing that vehicle. So the vacuum sanders are going to help um, where you're not dragging stuff in and making a mess to use that stall. But when you get into paint guns, I mean you look at even the mini jet has changed considerably over what it used to be. We get way more requests, you know, within the past year. It's like every year it's exponential, right? It seems like it's doubling every year almost in how can we keep a repair smaller? How can we, you know, get color match better on these fine silvers, these smaller spots? You know, some of the colors that are out there today, mm -hmm. spot repairs are not easy. No. And like you said, even the spray guns have adapted, right? We, uh, we all grew up with the older mini jet that mm -hmm. gave you that little football shaped pattern with a, a three one inch or smaller yeah. tip yep. on it. Yep. Little tiny tip, little mm -hmm. tiny pattern. Now our small, you know, considered a touch up spray gun, you know, our I look at them as more half of a full size gun. Sure. Because they kind of work similarly. Mm -hmm. uh, if I was going to have a ten inch spray pattern, now I'm gonna have a five to six normally, mm -hmm. but it's gonna be that nice elliptical. Uh, mm -hmm. That's well, and that's key even on, on, you get to the primer side. So mm -hmm. if you're starting to do quick lane repair and these small repairs, you don't want, you know, the way we always did it in our shop is once a gun is no longer very functional as a base gun, it's gotten beat up over the years, that's now a primer gun. It gets gun. the downgrade. Right. So it's spraying uneven and everything else. That's not going to work in a speed lane repair. You need a really good primer gun so you can spray small 
but keep the right atomization so everything lays out like it's supposed to so you can keep your your base down to a smaller area and try to avoid having to blend into a secondary panel. Um, it's, it, it goes back to that cost of repair too, right? Back to that primer process being one of the more abused in the past. Mm -hmm. High quality primaries aren't cheap. You know, you spray a blounce there up there around some base coats and some clear coats, but it's been ignored for so many years, a lot of times it's still an afterthought. Uh, we do a lot of trainings now with our mini jet, with our HVLP mini jet, with either a 1.2 or maybe even a 1.4 SR nozzle. Mm -hmm. But we also teach how you can dial that gun down just by choking the amount of fluid, right? Restricting that needle and you can get a spray pattern that's half an inch tall. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, it's back to that efficiency, only as big as you need, only priming the spot that you yeah. need. We're not making that repair larger than it needs to be mm -hmm. and you just you feel like you have more control with those small guns you know we we began teaching spot repair that way at the car manufacturers quite a f number of years ago that kind of a two-step process of i will set my spray pattern size with my fluid control for the size of the job i need if mm -hmm. i need a one inch two inch three inch four inch pattern i'll adjust my fluid to get to that okay that's step one the only other equation is air pressure. Sure. So now I need just enough air pressure to atomize my primer properly, just enough air pressure to make my color match. So if you break it down into kind of a one, two step, it's pretty simple. Mm -hmm. But now you have all the acceler accelerated curing options, yeah. you keep that repair small. Yeah, knocking a job out in an hour is, is totally feasible. And, mm -hmm. it, and it might be feasible with a half an ounce of primer, Mm -hmm. a half an ounce of base coat and a half an ounce of clear I mean, yeah. we're literally at that small of a number now where uh, we can prime an area the size of a basketball with an ounce of primer right and uh, i mean it's been a lot of years since i painted but i threw away a lot of ounces of primer <laughs> yeah. um, you it, leave more you used to leave more in the cup than you need than for you a total job to now yeah the technology has just come so far that way and again it's something that's very important to keep in mind when you start that layout process Things have changed drastically, and with some of that newer technology, you can either decrease your footprint and have increased production, or when you're using it to bring in a new line, like a, a speed lane type scenario, you're gonna need to carve out more space in your shop to have that dedicated area. So it can get complicated. Paint gets trickier every year, some of the new colors that come out. So being able to minimize the size of that repair with better quality products is crucial. You get to some of these three and now four stage paints. Yeah. If you have, you know, even a tiny dent or a rock chip in the middle of a fender, that can quickly turn into now I need to blend into the door if you get your primer out just a little bit too far. So make sure you do your homework. Use the people that are out there to help you. Um, both of our companies are always willing to help. Um, I mean, we work with a lot of people that don't even use our booths yet because we hope if we can help you now, um, and show that we can make your business operate a little bit better, a little bit smoother. Down the line when you need a booth, maybe you do look to us. Um, and the same with you guys, you've always been happy to help out with projects we have here that aren't even related to air or spray guns, right? So um, don't hesitate to reach out, the resources are there. Um, and we're excited to bring you more of these videos in the future. This is a fun first one. Um, we'll hopefully have a new one for you soon. There's also an article that'll be in ABRN that breaks down those numbers a little bit more. It's hard and we only have about an hour to really deep dive into some of these topics that are pretty technical. Um, so beyond just reaching out for questions, um, check ABRN because that article will really break down those numbers and show you how to really figure out on the tech side what you may need or how much square footage you might even need in your shop. Um, so we do dive a little bit deeper in there. but. I want to thank you guys for thank you, you, Jason. helping out today. It's been a lot of fun. Um, and I'm sure we'll see you guys in one of our future videos. And of course, I'm sure <laughs> at SEMA, hopefully we have hopefully a SEMA this year. Hopefully this year, yeah. So stay safe, everybody. Hopefully we can see you all at SEMA. And if anything comes up before that, don't hesitate to reach out. Thanks.